are dreamers. We come to you on a very exciting week, and we don't need a guest this week because why would we have a guest when it was your pub week, Margaret Joseph, it's official my, author? I know. And the Caviar Dreams Tuna Fish Budget Book is out, same name as the podcast. Very big week. I'm very excited. And for anyone who's watching, I've one in my hand. You can see one behind me with the beautiful smile and face of the Marge with her tuna fish bagel. Um, uh, yeah, amidst a beautifully adorned set, smooth, silky black cover with gold text. Yes. How do you and feel when you see this? I feel so good when I see it because I can't even believe it. My life in print for the world to read. No take backs. No take backs. I mean, great, great pictures in the middle of my life. And then when I read back the book and I did the audio as well so you could get it straight from the horse's mouth. Uh, I can't believe everything I've been through. Um, it's just crazy. It's just crazy to see my life in print. I've achieved a lot. Um, I feel like I'm resilient. I, I feel like I need more therapy. I, it's it's I think crazy. Resilience is a key theme in your life. And yes. your book. I would say that you are one of the most resilient people I've ever encountered. And I think it's, a, I've said it before, it's a very um, underestimated quality in people. And I do think it's funny because, you know, now we're starting to hear what people think of the book. And I heard uh, Bryce Sander last night say, you lived your life in chapters, which is really funny. And you're always keen to open a new chapter. How is it that you are so able to like, accept things and move on and keep your life moving how do you keep the pace of your life because reading through the book you know and we've read it mm -hmm. a million times in the edit one if not you know two if uh, any of these things would have shut most people down and could have put them into a hole for the rest of their life so how do you keep it going i just realized that you real i i had no other choice it has to be a positive outlook you cannot focus on your setback because what are you going to do? Just not get out of bed. You could be sad for one day, but you're not going to make anything better for yourself, your children, the people around you. If you cry about it, the, you have no choice, but to make it better. Yes. You cannot just crumble up and die. That's just, a, it's just, it's just not the way life goes. It's just bad things happen to good people. A lot of things are out of your control and it's my job in life to figure it out. And, and make it better. And that's just the way I feel. And it's just, I could be sad about it for a day, but it happens to everybody. It's whatever it may be. You cannot fix your childhood. You, and you cannot be responsible. Like I always say, what happens to you in your past, but it's your job as an adult to fix it. Mm -hmm. And you can't be a victim of your past. You cannot blame your past on why you're not succeeding in the future. You just have to put it behind you, not dwell on it, not deny that it happened, not bury it, Mm -hmm. deal with it and move yes. forward you know it's really interesting it's like your childhood created like the perfect storm to bring out the best characteristics in you oh thank you Lexi it's this is what I find so interesting so you were as you said before the parentified child yes so you had to hustle because you felt like everything fell to you yes I that's really what it is Mark Sear and I are only 20 years apart so if I didn't feel safe or nervous, I had no choice but to take care of myself in certain situations. My mother wasn't always there. She worked full time. She was a single mother. I didn't want to go to my grandparents after school. So who was going to make me lunch after school? No, it's I, I was true. seven years old. I was yeah. letting myself in the house. I had to take care of myself and be responsible. And to make yourself okay, you have to convince yourself that everything's going to be okay and, and figure out how to get it done. So I just became extremely capable. And the funny thing about it is, whilst Marge Senior was incapable in some ways of like what, what people consider normal parenting, which I hate that term because I don't think anyone's parents are normal and everyone at some point is embarrassed by their parents. And if your parents do appear normal, there's probably some freaky shit going on that you don't know about. So just keep that in mind and don't feel bad. But while Marge Senior didn't give you like a normal nurturing, like home with a meal on the table, she gave you a work ethic that combined with that like early sense of capability and responsibility, watching her as a work machine, always, always pushing, like created like, you know, b real blonde ambition. Yes. <laughs> you know, it's like, like Madonna said, this is blonde ambition. Like you too, even though it was unorthodox and it was strange and it was scary, it, I think it set you up for the life that you no, created. No, absolutely. It set me up to be successful, driven, 
a hustler. I mean, not always um, the calmest person <laughs> <laughs> and a total hypochondriac, but it also was the right fit for me. Mark mm -hmm. Sear and I were the right fit. Listen, do I know what it's like to have Bella? Bella, I'm the good mother to you, though, Bella. You never have to worry. <laughs> but, but it was it was the perfect storm. I absolutely agree. March Senior pushed me. Uh, I saw that she was a hustler. It made me want to work hard. I want to emulate her in many ways. And the redeeming thing is I wanted to not emulate her in many ways. It prevented me from drinking because I yes. saw excessive drinking and being a party girl um, to an extent wasn't always the prettiest. It, it could turn yes. a corner. So I knew to be a party girl up to a point, yeah. but I knew never to let it turn a corner. Certain things just weren't appropriate to do around children. So I knew what not to do. Yeah. Well, that's, <laughs> so that was a good lesson. I was learned. smart enough to know what not to do. I mean, some people grow up around that and emulate the exact same behavior mm -hmm. and, and don't know how to deal with it. Thankfully, I did. Yeah. So it really was the perfect storm. You're absolutely right. Now, we've talked before about your confidence. And, you know, you are so confident. You are confident in your abilities, your body, your um, your relationships. Like, you just have a very secure being. I've said it a hundred times. I've said both you and Joe are both two of the most secure humans I know. What do you accredit that, like, confidence to because insecurities can ruin people's lives yes i agree i think being confident in your own being and securing your own yeah. being um is a very important quality mm -hmm. and i think if you're not it ruins a lot of people and <laughs> and hurts friendships and does things i think the other thing growing up with martin senior really could have wrapped my confidence and because i always did not feel safe and the rug could be pulled out from under me the one thing she did do was always make me feel like I could achieve anything mm -hmm. and that I was capable, and I was pretty capable of doing a lot of things, <laughs> but always made me feel like I could achieve any dream I wanted to achieve, that I could do anything. She never held me back. Anything I wanted to do, she pushed me forward to do it. Oh, you could do that. Of course you could do that. You want to be that? You could be that. Mm -hmm. So I think when someone instills that in you and doesn't ever put you down. Yeah and champions all your crazy harebrained ideas and dreams, you become a confident person. That is one thing I learned to do with my children. I mean, my son was a tiny little pipsqueak and I was like, oh, you wanna play football? You could play football. I mean, he looked like an ant in his costume, <laughs> but he also, you know, his football coach would say he is the you know, heart of a lion, heart oh. of a lion. And I mean, he was the teeniest kid on the football team. And I think that's what it is. If you champion your children and and people around you and you give them the confidence and they get the boost as a young person they go through life with it i agree my parents never and you have it also i, I feel like anything. you are the yeah. same way you're very confident you were confident in your motherhood yeah. my mother-in-law uh mary joseph's god rest her soul you mm -hmm. said to me you're so confident in being a mother for such a young mother you're so confident oh, I love you that. never seem nervous or frazzled or this that and i said i go i don't know it just comes naturally yes. i mean why would i be nervous why would i be a lot of things, if things come from a place of love, yes, I think it's like a great ground. And like I was thinking, you know, I I let Nino stay up to like there's very few rules. He could eat whatever he wants. He could open the fridge and help himself. He could do anything. But he feels secure and confident and loved. Like he runs into school and he's like, "See you later, mom." And if he come, if my stepkids if they come with a harebrained idea. It's not my job to poo poo their ideas. It's my job to pick up the pieces and re-guide them if they those ideas don't work out like my parents did for me exactly it's not to put people down and and all of those things you know if, if people want to achieve certain things and it's your kids and I think my mother that's one thing she did I mean granted you know I say some things in the book that aren't that attractive about her and that made me feel insecure but she did so many other great things that it made up for all the crazy yes and I think people can see from why your relationship now on the show and just the way you and Marge Senior interact, you have a good relationship. You we have a great relationship. People really need to remember, like, she's only 20 years younger than you. So we look at girls 20 who years are older than 20 me. years older, no. sorry. <laughs> that, would, that would be sick. That would be that creepy. Would be a real sick thing. Um, that when we're discussing, like, this party girl that did all these crazy things, mm -hmm. she was, like, 24. Yes, she was 24. So when anybody compares and they say, oh, I've repressed feelings, or, like, on my show, and they're saying... Oh, don't say, you know, you've repressed feelings from your mother. My mother 
is not your age to no. women on my show. My women, yeah. the women on my show are 40 some, 40 plus year old mothers yes. who should know better. Yeah. By this age, if you haven't figured it out, maybe you want to just take another look. You yes, know, exactly. It, it, it's getting, it's getting old at this mm -hmm. age. I know myself. Um, so one thing I actually heard talking about confidence that really was interesting the other day that I think will be good for our listeners is I heard that if you're struggling with insecurities and confidence and you really are like just feeling that you're incapable, taking up a hobby that you're good at, no matter what it is and keep doing I it like that your idea. life, you're right. builds a little spark of confidence in yourself. So if you're good at needlepoint, do some needlepoint. If you're a great cook, bake something, cook something and take it to a friend. Those little things that we don't do very often. Yes, process, our, confidence our confidence boosters. boosters. I like that. And I think that we have to all remember that like we're all in this together and people are constantly trying to take us down. We compare and despair on Instagram and we look at everyone else's life and we say like, oh, I wish this was in my life. You know, it's natural to feel down. So we have to like boost our confidence a little bit ourselves. No, I think you're absolutely right. And every someone, everybody's good at something. I don't mm -hmm. care what it is. I mean, if you're good at putting on makeup, do your friend's makeup. Yeah. Teach someone how to do it. I I was always great at putting on fake eyelashes. That's a trope. Yes. It's All my true. friends for years, that. I've been putting on their fake eyelashes. I could even do it while driving. Not that I want to do that now and kill anybody and meme anybody, <laughs> but I really could do it. So it's just whatever it is, whatever I think that's a great idea, Lexi. That yeah, boosts a lot of confidence. Day. But also be complimentary of other people. Give yes. compliments where they need. I love to give out compliments and not blow smoke up people's asses. No. Asses. I don't give out fake compliments. No, I, I know. If as someone looks beautiful, you. I say they look beautiful. If I say they, they're interesting or they, they have a great story, mm -hmm. that's an amazing story. I will compliment people on anything that deserves a compliment, no matter how big or small. Yeah. If I'm in Starbucks, if I need the barista made my coffee, you made that so great. You know what? It makes people feel good. And I like to boost other people's confidence yeah. because this world has become very, very harsh. Yeah. I feel like now people are afraid to validate people's feelings or be nice to people or like try and like give a compliment because they feel like it'll get thrown back in their face. And yeah. I and I think that's, that live. is a horrible way to live. And I think we've become a much tougher society. And mm. I think men have become afraid. Yes. To compliment people because obviously I'm all about the Me Too movement, especially yes. whatever. Yeah, my everything book that you've gone through. And everything that I've gone through. But I haven't crossed the line where I'm just like, men cannot say anything. That's I still right. like the art of flirtation. Yes. I still like the art of chivalry. Mm -hmm. I still believe in manners. And good manners doesn't mean you're being inappropriate. And everything yes. isn't an underlying thing. And people, everything isn't crossing the line. And I think that's where we're going too far sometimes. Well, it becomes very easy to um, cry like, oh my God, alarmist insanity. Like this is like mm -hmm. too much, too much, too much. And then you lose the essence of like boundaries. And boundaries yes. are a big thing. And I, it's funny because, you know, we obviously have had the girls in the office with us working with the book and looking at the book and reading the book and sharing your stories. And I, I experienced similar stories to you. Like on my first day of work, when I was a fashion buyer at 19, there was no chair for me. I'm going to go share a chair with that guy, the sales guy, Hillier, sit on his lap. I'm a 19 year old girl. And I walked into an office enough to sit on the sales manager's lap. And granted, eventually he became my boyfriend. So obviously something worked out there, but it was super inappropriate at the time. Of course. And you were a 19 year old yeah. girl and we're just learning about ourselves, learning how to navigate the world. We're in the workplace and men who are in a position of power nowadays. And I mean, it still happens, but not as common as years ago. They would take mm -hmm. advantage of the situation. Yes. No one would call them out on it. You'd go to the next place. It was exactly the same. Mm -hmm. If you blew the whistle, you could not get a job somewhere else. It was, it was just, that's the way the world. And so yeah. of course you were just going to put up and shut up. And it's so funny to hear that. You'd be blackballed. The girls now, because we do live in a different world where people are speaking up. It's amazing to like, we discussed Cuomo when he put his hand on the staffer's back. And I was like, well, you know, he's an Italian man in his sixties. So my father-in-law would put his hand on a girl's back and whisper, you beautiful, maybe in her ear. And he wouldn't think anything inappropriate. And one of the girls in the office said, but now with everything they know that we've been through, they know that if they say, I'm uncomfortable with that, it, do it hopefully won't go any further. Yes. But if they don't say anything, then 
God knows where it goes next. So in one respect, I have like, I'm so proud of young girls now that they're able to say at the first sign that they don't feel confident that things are going in, down the pike in the yes. wrong way. So they can say, I'm not comfortable with that. You need to stop. Exactly. You know? But I think if you could say, I'm not comfortable with that, it needs to stop. It doesn't have to blow up into a whole Agreed. lawsuit or something like that. Yes. When I said this in my book, I changed the names. Mm -hmm. I wasn't looking to get anybody in trouble. I was just saying, this is a conversation that people mm -hmm. should be having with their daughters that I didn't know how to handle it until yes. I got older. That this was going on. It was commonplace. This happened to me more than once. Mm -hmm. yeah. And it, it was disturbing. Yeah. And, and why did it happen to me? And I, and I go into more in the book of why was I intimidated by men? Because I do, I am very outspoken. I do have a big mouth. And I think things had happened to me in my life that I, I didn't know how to handle. And, and there was a mixed message back then. Women used their sexuality to get ahead. So, but you couldn't cross the line. And, and where was the line? And it, it was a very hard time. Mm -hmm. I, I think it's, I think it's still a hard time. And as much as we're going forward, I feel like we're going backward at the same time because some things that people find empowering, I find very vulgar and unempowering to women. I agree, I agree. Which I think is, you know, it's a, it's a very awkward time. But so obviously we went through the pandemic and you were writing the book. And at the same time as writing the book, oh, the pandemic, I'm sorry, people, I yawned. We've exhausted you on this. Yes, I'm sure. exhausted. We've had it going on every show, every minute. She's like, 20 interviews an hour. It's insane. It's again, it's a tribute to your resilience. While she wrote this book, it was a pandemic. So obviously business was not, you know, fabulous. Everyone was suffering. You were also filming housewives and you were doing a full scale renovation of your home. Yes. Now, any one of those things could have caused most people to have a meltdown. I know if like my house is a mess. My head feels a mess. I can't get calm in the chaos. How do you juggle all those things and still manage to like get stuff done? Um, I have you. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, I'm blessed to have Alexi. So that's how that's that how I funny. can manage. To, I, so that's how I can manage to get things done. Yeah. I have an amazing support system. Yes. Uh, so I'm blessed to have you. I have. Lisa and Lindsay, yeah. obviously. So I have amazing women in my life that I can yes. lean on and, and who do a lot for me. So that's very grateful. Uh, I've also learned to compartmentalize yes. and try and work on certain things at certain times. But of course it takes its toll. We're all human. Yeah. Uh, getting the book done was very therapeutic and cathartic at the same time, yes. working with a collaborator, yeah. Emily, and then having to put my voice into it and putting our spin on it which, which was, you did so which well. Which I did so well. You, this I mean, book is so were just, your voice. You know, working with the ghost is just like, those are words on a page until mm -hmm. you put your emotion and your word and your spin on it. Yes. So that was just up all night with you and Lisa and <clears throat> for a month straight. So I think certain time, you know, by that time I was exhausted. Mm -hmm. And, but everything I do is a labor of love that I really want to do. And I'm passionate about it. I'm yes. passionate about my home. Uh, this is a project that I, I just love so much and I love this house and it's historical and the way I feel about architecture, I just love it so much. I don't think everybody understands the way I feel about design and mm -hmm. the love of it. And maybe everybody doesn't love my taste, but it is great taste. I don't give a shit what anyone says. The people that count. The people that taste. count so love my taste and, and understand it. And but it's also a pleasure for you. Like it's, it's a, a pleasure. pleasure to have your desk scattered with fabric swatches. Yes, so and, like, I, and I just love it and, and putting everything together with you and, and everybody I've worked mm -hmm. with. And doing the book was as painful as it was, and I, I just loved it, to share my life with everybody that they don't know about me because you just see a little slice of it. There, I think there is a lot to learn from yes. it. I think not coming from the Lucky Sperm Club, growing up with a single mother mm -hmm. in, a, in a time that it wasn't common, uh, is very interesting to people. Being married to someone 20 years older, the, the, um, the dissolving of a marriage, of a, yes. a long-term marriage, a 20-year marriage. So many people go through it. They don't know how to navigate it. The pain, the, the happy moments, the sad moments, the still mourning it years later because you did have amazing times with your family and your children. Even though I'm so madly in love with Joan, we have a perfect, amazing life. 
and everything I've ever wanted. That doesn't mean that you don't miss your, you know, your family time and things like that. Yeah, there's a lot of people I'm sure going through as well, because there's one thing that I think gets overlooked a lot of times is, and it's because, you know, I have this in my relationship, mothers of stepkids also, when that relationship dissolves, that's a whole other shit storm. That is not like, you know, you, it's a, that's very difficult. So this story is so relatable on so many levels because you've really had such a broad spectrum of challenges in your life. Yes. I, and it's just, and that's what it is. It's like, I never looked at my stepkids as my stepkids. They're my whole life. They yeah. never live with their mother. Uh, I'm my son who is, you know, that's their half brother and half sister. And they're all so close. So that makes me happy. Yes. And they're such a bonded family, so, but I don't get to have those, all those times together. And, and to be honest, their times have changed. So I know they mourn that. And it's, it's, and I want it all to be together, but for some reason, some of them can't move past it. So it's so crazy yeah. to me. So I think just sharing that with everybody, because so many other people go through these things and I know it because they write to me. Well, so many people live unhappy for the sake of their family, but I think it's something that we've said a million times again, you have to put your own mask on before you help anybody else. If you're not doing good, your family is not doing good. Yeah, and I don't You've got think to strive for your own happiness. Exactly, and people are always worried about shame and shaming someone in this and that, and that's just no way to live. And mm -hmm. I've said it numerous times: if you're not happy, no one else around you is going to be happy. Yeah. And it, and you know, sometimes there is collateral damage, but everybody gets through, and everybody has to have their own journey. And th this has been my journey and I've had four lives and it's, ch and just like Bryce said, I've lived my life in chapters and there's a lot more chapters to go. I mean, Marge yeah. Singer still has goals and I think everybody has to have goals regardless if you don't work outside the home. Being a stay-at-home mom is a goal. Yeah. And, 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 and your goal is to make sure to raise the healthiest, happiest, educated children ever. Yes. Now, I know this has been something that we've <clears throat> encountered on the season, the little accusation of mom shaming which really pisses me the fuck off because of all the people I know in the world you are the least mom shaming person ever I mean you held my leg when I gave birth and I brought my son to work for a year and someone else who worked with us Janine for the longest time really you hear about in the book um before Janine moved out of state because of her husband's job Janine brought her son to work. Yes. I I brought my stepkids to work. Yes. I would have anybody bring their kids to work. Yeah. We we have like mini daycare here. Up until Nino went to school, he would yeah. come to work all the time. So I find it very bizarre that that when I said her husband's a meal ticket, that that was even taking his mom shaming. Yeah. It, was it had nothing to do with it. Things. It had to do with she values material things. Mm -hmm. More than anything. More than and her identity. Goals. No, oh, her identity of her marriage. She was insulting my marriage. Is of uh, the reason she doesn't argue with her husband or can't be herself is because her values are materialistic in her marriage, and that's what she values. So of course she wasn't going to ever speak up to him because she just wants. You know, she was. It's her value system is that only of what he brings to the table. Yes. And that's, and that's what I felt. And I felt, I, you know, she really valued herself and her position. She wouldn't, she wouldn't say, you know, behave that way. Yeah. She wouldn't be saying, oh, well, he bought me this married to a plastic surgeon in her bio. Yes. Uh, all of those things, just talking about the material wealth they have. I just, I've got this, I bought this. I have an unlimited credit limit. That's how you derive your happiness. To me, something is wrong and you yes. only value you know, it's a, it was okay. an analogy slash metaphor. And yes. I think I can't, you know, with certain people, I can't speak that way. No, I think it falls on deaf ears. And I think that, you know, I imagine one of your intentions with this book was to help other people with relationships with their parents and relationships that yes. they could change with their children because of what you've experienced. Yes, exactly. And that I've experienced things and maybe I like to learn from other people mm -hmm. and what they've gone through. And I'd love to meet people and learn from them. And I think some of, unfortunately, some people I'm on a show with, it falls on deaf ears, but so many other people it hasn't. So I'm very, very blessed. Yeah. Now, compare and despair is a big thing. You've gone through so many things in your business. So many, like, you know, brands we've watched grow, fall, um, you know, like your house renovation hasn't been the easiest journey. How do you make sure that you keep on track without looking at other people and getting 
envious, jealous, because I know those are emotions that could like drag people down. And I just, you, you don't <laughs> suffer from that. No, I just don't care. I, you know what? It's about my life and what I've achieved and uh, knowing that I've done the best. I, I just don't compare my life to anybody else's because I make my life the best that it could possibly be for me and my yes. situation. And you're Whatever. so busy. And I'm so busy. Don't I, don't have, I don't have time to look at what everybody else is doing and wishing I had anybody else's life. I've yeah. created the life that I want for myself. So why would I look at what anybody else has? Yes. And, and, I, and I want everybody to have great things and want their happiness. And so why would I choose to be jealous or envious or, you know, someone's fixed their house? I make my home... I have a happy home. I've always yes. had a happy home. No matter how big my home has been, I take my time to do things the way I want to do it. Um, I mean, you know, of course I would have liked to do it a tiny bit quicker, <laughs> but it, you know, what's important to me is my relationships with people. And I just feel like I never look at anybody and want somebody else's life. It's, that would be weird. I know. I think also it's because we have been aware of other people like for instance like Jen Shaw you know yes. she could have come on the show and people are like wow she has so much money she has this great show she has this we know there's so many smoke screens in life yes I think so many just people from show I know brands that look huge meanwhile like they're gone the next moment you know exactly and I and I look at that all the time and I'm just like no one's happier than someone else no like just you everybody really don't know what anyone else really has no, or what they, or if they're happy and they wake up with a smile every day. And I really, yeah. I don't care. So anybody who, th I don't think anybody's jealous of me. I don't, I'm not jealous of anybody else. I no. just think that's a very weird way to exist. I agree. And I, anybody who thinks that way and says horrible things or accuses people of being jealous is only people of jealousy within themselves. I agree. It's something that comes from within. So obviously you've now written the book, The Home Renovation is Done. What is next, Margaret Josephs? Well, I, well, I would love to, as you and I always say, we love to mentor people. Yes. I love working with the Women's Center yeah. downtown because that's working with women who are getting back on mm -hmm. their feet, who are out of the workplace, who've been abused. So we have to focus. I really want to focus yeah, on I that agree. and do that. And then, of course, we want to do our mocktail because yes. I'm a known not drinker. Mm -hmm. And we're, how many iced teas could one girl order when she yes. goes out? And I feel like so many people are trying to find a better way of being healthier, not drinking. And they're always ordering a, a seltzer or a flavored water or something like that. Yeah, so why don't we do drinks. something kind of like a sophisticated mocktail that could be like a cocktail if they want to spike yes. it, but a mocktail. Well, I think it's good. Because people the, order mocktails when they go out. So why not have one that you can have at home in a yep. can? And so, you know, you and I'll be doing soiree. We will soiree. And I think the important thing with that also is drinking, your drinking, not lack of drinking, has always been such a focus because people are so intrigued when someone chooses not to drink and doesn't have an issue. I know. It's so funny. I know. And I think people are always like, well, why didn't you come? Well, there's nothing to come clean about. Yeah. My mother drank too much. I, I saw when it turned a corner, it's not pretty. Yeah. And I think we've all witnessed how not pretty it can be across many shows. Yeah. Many reality series. I think a lot of people suffer with substances. Yeah. And I just don't find it attractive. And but you also get headaches. And I get a so horrible medically, headache. It's not fun for you either. Yes. And I think, and I love a good fun drunk. A yes. gypsy drunk, a cute one, you know? Yes. You actually could hold your liquor very uh, yeah, well. Yeah, it's, it, but it's waning as I get older. I think the, the older you get, it's harder to hold your liquor. But I think that the fun thing about making a mocktail is it's inclusive. It's not like supposed to separate you. This is the drink you want to drink at a party. Yes, it's the drink you want to drink at a party. It's inclusive. It tastes good. And you party like a rock star, wake up like a superstar. I'm all about that. We're all about it. Well, I, Lexi, thank you for interviewing I, me about I'm my so book. I'm so happy that we talked about this today. So everyone, um, the audio book is out also. Here, straight so, from the horse's mouth. And there's a few little surprises in there, a few guest appearances. Uh, it's very cute. You're going to love hearing it in Margaret's voice. Buy the book. I'm yeah, serious. buy the book. Let's Jesus. get this girl to the top of every bestseller list you're on your bestsellers list number one yesterday on amazon number one on amazon in my category so we gotta boost it boost it let's go buy the book people keep buy dreaming the book. keep dreaming caviar dreams you're gonna love it. Yes. yes oh i wanted to say this this was important 
Bryce Sander said yesterday in your virtual book signing that he learned more about the licensing industry and royalties from your book mm -hmm. than he did in all seasons of Shark Tank. Hello, people, read the book. If read you want a book. business, if you're an entrepreneur, even if you have a little idea that you want to go to a big one, you want to read this book. It will inspire you, empower you, and motivate you. Yeah.